morning. Good morning. It's still a good morning. I'm gonna. It's gonna be kind of backwards. Um, I I very much appreciate the worship this morning. Benjamin and Christian McKenzie, I thank you guys very much for stepping in. But I, I want to kind of thank thanks to Steve and Angie because for well, I don't know how many years you guys have actually been doing it here, but it's been ever since I've been here, and that's coming up on nine years. Uh, Steve and Angie are faithful week in and week out to organize worship for us and, and lead us into the, the, the presence of God. And so, um, you know, we're not a really big church. We're getting bigger. I think we're a fantastic church. But in this church, we've got, you know, four or five different groups of people that can get up and be involved in worship. And I think that's absolutely fantastic. We have that many people. And, you know, music ability comes and it goes. But, but people that are willing to get up and, and be involved in worship and, and the song service. And I think that speaks well to Stephen and Andy for their, their uh, fulfilling their role as the worship leaders in the church. So thank you guys very much. And for the rest of you that are involved, thank you very much. Um, we are going to continue to uh, do another section of our um, testify. I have asked, uh, actually I asked a couple weeks ago, but it's worked out today that uh, Kathy Edmond is going to come and, and share with us our testimony. expect and um, sometimes thrilling and treacherous and scary and and although I'd like to be that guy in the front that's raising his hands yeah, you know not holding on in reality a lot of the times I'm that person with the grip death grip on the thing and and, um, um, and I'd like to have more faith and I'd like to try and uh, and just completely move freely through this life and and trusting God, and, and that's what I'm working on, so. But um, I was born and raised in Southern California, um, and my parents divorced when I was really pretty young, and my dad remarried a lady, um, a Christian lady, a wonderful Christian lady, actually, and um, she would uh, tell my sister and I about the Lord. And um, my sister's older than me, and so most of it was directed at her. And so I would just sit and listen. And you know, even being a young child, I would listen and hear. And I know she led us in the sinner's prayer, but you know, I wasn't there with her. I was, I felt in my heart, you know what? Mm -mm, I'm thinking about this. I understood even then that what she was saying was a life choice and a, would make a difference in your whole life and change your whole direction in your life. And so I held off and I held back. And, um, and I remember being home with mom um, in bed. And I was a child, mind you. So um, I laying in bed and asking God if you're real. <laughs> and we had this toy cash register on the desk in the room. God, if you're real, make this cash register go up in the air. And <laughs> uh, you know, and I was staring at the thing, and no, it didn't happen. And um, I did that for a couple nights. I'm not sure how many, but. Um, um, I remember the night that I just, I prayed that again, and I said, you know what, God, it doesn't matter. I, I, even though you didn't make, you know, make this thing go up and down, you know what, I believe. Um, I believe everything that Elaine was someone said. I believe you are, you are God, and I knew at that point, I even knew, I was only probably third grade. I knew I was a sinner. I knew that I needed to be changed from the inside out. And um, and like a little child, and just with a childlike faith, um, I accepted him into my heart and into my life. And I remember, I remember him washing through me and over me and his love just filling me. Um, 
And that salvation was real, it was complete, and, um, and I was changed. And, um, and I had a hunger and a thirst for the word, and, um, and I loved to be at church. And my, my dad and my stepmom would take me to, well, my stepmom would take me to, at that point, they were living in Southern California in Orange County. We went to the hey. Calvary Chapel with uh, Chuck Smith, and I remember sitting there, and I wanted to be in church. I didn't want to be in the Sunday school because I just, I could feel, you know, the warmth, the love, the Holy Spirit there. And it was there that I learned to hear, you know, God's voice and to recognize it. You know, the Bible says, um, his sheep hear his voice, mm -hmm. and recognize his voice. And that's when I learned to recognize his voice. Um, then later on, you know, back at home with mom, for various reasons, but mostly just my own sin nature, you know. It's so common. I, you know, in junior high or whatever, just started to fall away, started to fall away. And um, in high school, joined into the whole party life and everything that that had to do with the 80s and the party life in Southern California. And, um, you know, it got ugly. There's no doubt. It got very ugly. And, you know, did I feel guilty? Yeah. At the beginning, I felt guilty, and the more I continued in that life, the more that was kind of seared. And I didn't so much. And I continued on in that life. Um, I met Scott. Um, and wait, I've got to say also that when I was younger, I was the one that was praying for my mom. You know, I was, Lord, you know, save her. And um, and she did come to Christ mm -hmm. when we were in, when I was in high school. She did come to Christ, and then it was her that turned around and started praying for me. <laughs> but um, I met Scott as a senior in high school at 17, and um, and then I went away to college in Durango, Colorado. And um, wow, did I flounder! <laughs> I was. Uh, I was a good student, you know, I had always been a good student, but, uh, you know, the lifestyle I was living, boy, I floundered, and um, I recognized it as the low point in my life, um, and I needed to go home, and I needed to go back to my family and to Scott, and so that's what I did, and, but before I left there, um, I had to close out a bank account, and I went into the bank, and I had to sit there. This lady was taking forever. It was a God-appointed thing, though, because under the, uh, on her desk, underneath the glass, um, was the footprints poem. And, and, you know, having nothing better to do, I read that poem, and I recognized, um, I recognized the voice of the Lord reaching out to me in that poem. You know, where, where are you, God, when, you know, it's just one set of footprints? No, it's then that he carried me. And he carried me through that time. He was carrying me then. And the overwhelming feeling of, are you kidding me? You know, everything I've been, everything, the life I've been living, but yet God would not let go. He was faithful when I was not. And it overwhelmed me just that he would even uh, spend the time to speak to me again, that he would not give up on me. And I started crying, and I'm not a cry, much of a crier. I started crying in that bank, and I knew that that was kind of the beginning of the end. But it took a while. <laughs> I came home and, um, and um, just promptly um, got pregnant. Um, and I thought, you know what? This is what I deserved. This is what I deserve, you know, living the life I was. And um, <laughs> little did I know, I did not deserve that. That was a blessing of God. When I saw it as, that's what I deserve, this you know, punishment or whatever, what an unbelievable blessing of God. And what, what, <laughs> what God did for me in his fierce grace for me, to, um, to bring me back to him through the birth, and that's chance we're talking about. You guys know him, you know? It's just, um, it was a little bit later after, after giving birth to chance that I came home one night and looked at him in the crib and God spoke to my heart again and I knew he was mine to take care of. My, who else was, you know, Scott, yes, but mine to take care of. And what was I doing with my life? 
and I met a friend who, um, or re-met a friend who invited me to church, and um, I just walked up to the front of the church in the altar call and just completely laid it all down. And um, completely gave it completely over to him once and for all, a and um, of course God, <laughs> because I wasn't the woman that he married. Almost overnight. <laughs> Whoa, what happened to this woman that I married? But, um, you know, glory to God for that, though. Um, so, so um, then I was just discipled in, church, in the church in California. I came out here and completely discipled. And, and we always felt like it was our calling to change the generational yuck of our children. And to change, you know, that it stops with us. That whatever the hit that we have to take to to make it happen, we're going to do that. And um, only by the grace of God is this not everything that we, you know, both sides of our families, you know, had all kinds of yet. And it was not going to continue on down the generations of our kids by the grace of God. And and um, so that's what I've been up to since then, pretty much. And, <laughs> and encouraging my kids and, and living for the Lord. And I just, you know... Um, it's an amazing life. It's a wild ride, and um, but he's in control, and he's got it all under under control. So that's my story. <laughs> opportunity to, to share with other people their testimony and, and the things that God has done in their lives. And I hope you're encouraged as well because, um, you know, a lot of what I hear other people going through, it makes me feel better about the stuff that I've gone through. And it gives me hope sometimes that, uh, well, hey, here's, here's a living example that they got through it. And, and so there's hope. So um, we're going to jump into Colossians chapter 3. We're going to shift gears. We're going to low now. Okay. Um, Colossians chapter 3. Paul's writing. He's uh, confronting the church of Colossae. He's dealing with the situation with the pre Gnostic movement. You know, the, ooh, the mystery knowledge. you got to be on the in club to get to heaven. And. and uh, you know, the, the whole thing that came out, the flesh is bad, that still permeates the church today. Um, he got into, he was uh, confronting the Judaizers. Oh, in order to be a good Christian, you got to be a good Jew. And, and uh, but, but right now, he's just giving us a character description. What someone saved by grace looks like. And he's just, he's kind of bringing us right back to the basics. And... We're starting in verse 12. I'm going to read a, a little bit. And uh, then I'll to share with you some things that God's put on my heart. Um, verse 12, it says, Put on then as God's chosen ones, holy and beloved, compassionate hearts, kindness, humility, meekness, and patience, bearing with one another, and if one has complaint against another, forgiving each other, as the Lord has forgiven you, you also forgive. And above all these, put on love, which binds everything together in perfect harmony, and let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts, to which indeed you were called in one body, and be thankful. Now, we, we finished up the first part of this. We talked about what it means to be God's chosen ones. Uh, you know, I shared with you, it's, it's an offense to me when I hear people say, oh, we're all God's children. That's a lie. That's not true. John... And his gospel tells us that only to those who believe did he give the right to be called the children of God. Okay? So if they're an unbeliever, they're, they're a creation of God, oh, without a doubt. Mm -hmm. But they're not his children. Okay? So we talked about what it means to be chosen ones, to, to be holy and beloved, to be set aside, to be pulled out of where you were and put in someplace new. I've got to move this over. I'm going to trip over this thing. So, 
Then we talked about compassionate hearts, kindness, humility, meekness, and last week we covered patience. These are all fruit that should be exhibited in our life because we're plugged into the vine. Okay? When we're plugged into the vine, fruit grows out from it. It's the fruit that comes from the vine, not from a particular branch. The branch derives its fruit from the vine. Okay? But now we're moving into something else. Now, now he's kind of giving us instruction. Okay, now you're here. You're plugged in. This is what you look like. Now it's time for some pruning. Now we're going to dress up this, this, this branch. We're going to trim away some dead stuff. And we're going to make new stuff so that it'll grow and it'll be healthy. And he starts with something that I think is so desperately needed in the church today. He says, bearing with one another. Man, that's so huge. And we just kind of blink over this because it's not really one of the <clears throat> patches, passages, you know? It's just kind of one of those that you kind of jump over to get to the <clears throat> passage. Okay? But, it, but bearing with one another. And right along with that, hand in glove. And if one has a complaint against another, forgiving each other. Now, notice the way that he sets this up. I think this is pretty cool. It's two steps. First step. You're in the present. God has made us to be creatures that dwell in one time. Okay? He dwells in all time. Past, present, future. All at once. We dwell in one time. Okay? I can't take back what I just said. It's gone. I cannot go back and do anything about it. Nor can I understand what you're going to do two minutes from now. I don't even know what I'm doing two minutes from now most times. Okay? But I'm in the present. That's how God created us, to dwell in the present. So in the present, we have to bear with one another. Now there's, there's two uh, alternative meanings that can be derived from this, and I'm, I'm going to share kind of both of them with you. Okay? But before we go on, I want to I wanna tell you a quote. If you guys have probably heard this. It says, uh, Forgive your enemies. Nothing annoys them that much. <laughs> okay? Forgive your enemies, because it's really going to annoy them. Now, that, that's a quote by Oscar Wilde. You guys know who Oscar Wilde is? Okay, he's an author. Um, he, wrote the, he wrote a number of books, but the, uh, probably the best known uh, the picture of Dorian Gray. Um, Oscar Wilde was a hedonist. Give me, give me, give me, give me. Live in the moment. Drink it up. Snort it up. Sex it up. Give me it all because when this life is over, I'm gone. Okay? Now, if this man, who was so very far removed, as a matter of fact, I heard it said that the picture of the Dorian Gray was actually kind of his autobiography. Okay? That was kind of him telling his story in a fictional tone. And if you remember the picture of the Dorian Gray, this man made a deal whereby um, he would never age and the, the license that he took with his life and all the sin that he engaged in would never appear physically in his life. It would all appear on this, self, this portrait of himself that he kept hidden away. Okay? And, and as he went through life, the picture would grow old and it would bear the brunt of the, the physical signs of his sin and the debauchery. And they, they really, they think this is kind of an autobiography for Oscar Wilde. But you know what, the point I want to make is Oscar Wilde understood the power of forgiveness. Okay. Now if this is a man who is so far removed from God that, that uh, I mean, just read a little bit of his life and you'll understand how far removed from God he was. If he understood the power of forgiveness, how much more should we, who have been forgiven not much, but everything, how much more should we understand the power of forgiveness? So let's go back to our two-step process. We're dwelling in the present. That's all we've got. Okay? Can't undo anything that's been done. There's no way to understand what's coming. So we dwell in the present. So step one, right now, bear with one another. Okay? You know, you ever have people that just annoy you? Okay. There are just groups of people that just annoy each other. 
okay? And just, they can walk in the room and you just go, Ooh. you don't even have to know them, okay? First time meeting, they walk in the room and you just go, Ooh. okay? Some of those people are in this room, for some of you. <laughs> and some of you are those people maybe for me or for them and them and them. Okay, but, but that's not the point. You see, God designed us that way. God made us on purpose because if we were all noses, where would our sense of taste be? And who would scratch when it itched? Okay? So that, that's not a mistake. Now sometimes it's blown out of proportion because we're stupid. I can be really stupid sometimes. I, I can really, I like things done in a certain way. I call it perfectionist, but it's really just being selfish. I want it done my way. Okay? My poor wife. She has so much grace for me. Because... Could you please just... Thank you. And we always talk in marriage group about the towels. Okay? And this, this is God's evidence in my life for me. And, and to my wife, I think it's more blessing to her. I hate wadded towels. I just, I, I do. I, it's one of those things that I wish you could just kind of take out and throw away. But I walk into a room and I see a wadded towel and it just, just treating it. You dry your hands on that thing and it's not going to dry for when I need to dry my hands. Hang it. Let it dry. Now Christy doesn't care. Well, she cares because of me, but not because of the towel. And she's okay with it. Off she goes. Probably to go fix my sandwich in the 12-step process. <laughs> okay. Now, I can be, and for, for a good part of our marriage, I was really a snot about towels. And I would, I would be in the, wash my hands, turners, open the door, wet hands, open the door, walk all the way out, down the hall, into the kitchen. Christy, the towel! Please, could you please put the towel the way it's supposed to go? And she would come back and she would shake out the towel. Off she'd go and then I could dry my hands. I'm just showing you that because we all have areas that we can be stinkers in, right? We all have areas that we can be stinkers in. That's in the moment, right? In the moment. In the moment, we bear with one another. Okay, and that, that goes hand in glove with what we're talking about with the forgiveness. But there's, there's another bearing with one another that, that I think also can be mentioned because it's, it's the same word usage. Bearing one another's burdens. Okay, now this I think is actually a little bit more involved and a little bit more intricate. Because see, when we come into the body of Christ, we become part of something bigger than ourselves. Okay, and yeah, we're, we're part of the body of Christ universal. All the saints that have gone before, the saints that are, the saints that are going to come. We're a part of that. Okay, but we're also called to be a part of something specific, and that's the local body. Okay? We, when we become involved with the local body, it, it takes more than just showing up and plopping in the chair. At some point, there has to be a developing of trust, a sharing, an opening, a willingness to lay out, to get stepped on. Okay? Now, how can I bear your burdens? Can I, how can I help you bear your burdens <clears throat> if you're closed? If you won't share your burdens? Okay? Now, yeah, I know Jesus said, come to me, all you who are weary and heavy laden, cast your cares on me, give me your burdens. I understand that, but, but do you understand what we are? We are the body of Christ. And so we are a part of that bearing that burden. Okay? Quite honestly, I think it's an absolute shame to the body of Christ if somebody needs a miracle that the body can provide just mundanely. What am I talking about? God, I need groceries. I need you to provide groceries for me and my babies. I think it's a shame when God has to speak to someone in the grocery store to go and provide that for you because your church body did not. Okay? Now, blessings to God that He does those things. Absolutely. But what a shame that the, the, the local body doesn't. Now, there, again, we've we got two problems here. 
One is ignorance. Did you tell them you were in need? I've been in situations where somebody was offended because the church did not step up to help them. They never let anybody know. I had no clue you were having a problem. Well, you should have. Okay, well, which room is mine? Because I'm moving in. <laughs> uh, how, how am I supposed to know if you don't tell me? Okay, that's, that's one part of the shame. Okay, the other part of the shame is if you did know and did nothing about it. James talks about that. John talks about that. Okay, so bearing with one another. So first we have the understanding, and we're going we're gonna to touch on this a little bit more. We have the understanding of bearing with one another as in putting up with each other, just dealing with each other's idiosyncrasies. But we also have the understanding that we're there to uplift each other, to be a support to each other, to guard each other. To guard each other. Do you understand that? You look at the full armor of God, there's nothing covering my backside. Because that's your job. And there's nothing covered in your backside because that's my job. You understand that? Okay. Bearing with each other. But let's go back to our first interpretation of this. Our first understanding. Because while I believe the second one is accurate, I think the first one is really what Paul is dealing with here. I think this is really specific to what he's telling the Church of Colossae. And I believe what he's telling us in this moment. Okay? Um, he continues on. He says, okay, bury with one another. And if you have a complaint against another, forgiving each other. Now, I know nobody in here has ever had a complaint against a brother or sister in Christ. <laughs> we, because we're more mature than that. And they're more mature than that. I lie because I have a lot of complaints against brothers and sisters in Christ. I, I've had a lot throughout my, my life. I have some right now. As a matter of fact, this, this uh, message today has been a real struggle for me because God brought up a couple things. People that I haven't forgiven in my life. And I'll, I'll tell you, one of them is really, really stupid. But it makes me mad. We were playing softball on a church softball team. By the way, I don't play softball anymore. <laughs> but we played softball on a church softball team. And there was a guy on the team, I'd grown up with him in church, and, and quite honestly, I thought he was a jerk, I still think he's a jerk. Okay, and that, that's part of my unforgiveness. Um, this guy never showed up to practice, he was, you know, uh, he was a very good athlete, uh, very gifted. Uh, when he showed up, it was like, all right, we guaranteed at least one run, you know. Um, but, you know, he, he didn't know how to play as a team because he never showed up to the practices. Well, we got together after a sound whooping, and we were talking about what was needed, and, and I spoke up, and I said, well, you know, it really help people get their butts to practice. And he turned around to me and said, shut up. And I about went across the circle at him. Now, you think, oh, not a big deal. The other day when God brought this to my mind, I was so angry, I was livid, thinking about that offense. Now, I, okay, yeah, that's stupid. It's stupid. I, in my intellectual brain, or quasi-intellectual brain, okay, just in my brain, <laughs> I can acknowledge this is stupid. But in my emotion, in my gut, and I thought, oh, Jesus Christ, that was 24 years ago. Let it go, dude. Just let it go. Why well, thought I had? No, I just put it out of mind. Okay. So when I'm what I'm going to share with you, I'm not sharing because I've got it. I'm sharing because I'm getting it. Okay. It's a process. I'm working through it. So don't come come with the understanding that I'm on a pedestal at all. Because I know there are areas that I have unforgiveness in. And I'm being dealt with that. Okay, so our first step is bearing with one another in the moment. Okay. Step two, he says, and if anyone has complaint, forgiving each other. Okay, so step two is, 
If you realize someone has offended you, refer to step one. Okay? Because what we, we live in what? We live in the present. Okay? So if someone has a complaint, it's already something in the past because it happened. So refer to step one, get back in the present, bear with one another, forgiving each other. Now, you know, you've heard the, the sayings, you know, uh, unforgiveness is a chain that you put about yourself and bind yourself with. I've I got a better illustration. Okay? Unforgiveness is someone laying out all the ingredients before you and you mixing up the bitterest cup of gall and continuing to drink it throughout your life. Okay? You choose it. You embrace it. You accept what they've given. Instead of ignoring it and going on, instead of letting it go and saying, no, I, I don't want this, you sit there and daily, two of this, three of that, squeeze that, whatever that is, stir well, shake, Disgusting! Oh, that's horrible! Oh, I hate it! That's what we do with unforgiveness. Okay. So, understanding. Unforgiveness is a sin against yourself as much as it is against them. It's also an affront to God. It's an offense before God. Now, we're going to read uh, a couple of passages. Um... Jesus is talking in uh, Matthew chapter 6. Let's go over there real quick. I want to just share some things with you. <clears throat> he's, he's laid out the model prayer. Okay. I, you know, some people call it the Lord's Prayer. Some people call it the Disciples' Prayer. Some people call it the Sample Prayer, the Model Prayer. He's giving us kind of an outline as to how we should pray. The focus of where we should. And if you, you know, you go through the Lord's Prayer, you realize very little of it has to do with you. Contrary to how we pray today, you know, where God give me this, God give me that, don't let this happen to me, and get that person on my behalf, and da 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 da, and it's all about me. Uh, you know, there's very little of that in here. But when he gets to the end, he says something kind of interesting. And I want to just talk with you about this. Um, so in verse 14, he says, For if you forgive others their trespasses, he's referring back to uh, verse 12, he says, And forgive us our debts, as we also have forgiven our debtors. See, there's, there's kind of a condition there. <laughs> now, we're, we're going to talk about this in a minute, but there's a, a kind of a condition put here. Forgive me in the measure that I've forgiven them. Ouch. Now, Jesus is addressing this specifically. He says, For if you forgive others their trespasses, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you do not forgive others their trespasses, neither will your heavenly Father forgive your trespasses. Now, first I want to clarify something. This is not a salvation proclamation here. Okay? This is not um, Jesus saying, you know, if you don't forgive that debt, then you ain't going to heaven. You're not in. This is more a comparative statement. Okay? The, what he's saying in here is this is the measure to which you are to strive. This is the measure. If you want to live in unforgiveness, you have placed yourself above God. You have put yourself in a position of authority that is beyond God. Because you have said... Your ability to forgive everything, I, I'm, I'm not doing that. I'm reserving for myself the right to be offended. What he's doing is he's comparing here the difference. Now, keep in mind this is at the start of his ministry. Okay? You know, he's, he's still got a couple years down the road before the cross. As a matter of fact, he, a little bit earlier you're saying, you know, I didn't come to abolish the law. We're not coming to get rid of the law. I've come to what? Fulfill. fulfill it. Everything, every jot and tittle has been fulfilled in his life, death, resurrection. Okay? Done. Accomplished. The righteous requirement of the law has been fulfilled on my behalf. 
I couldn't do it. Couldn't do it. You can't do it. Mother Teresa didn't do it. No, there's no one good enough. None. Okay? So, as he's coming through here, he's laying out a principle. He's establishing something new that the Jews don't really get. And, and quite honestly, I say the Jews because that's who he's talking to. But by extension, we don't really get. Okay? We don't understand this whole forgiveness thing. You know, we still have the mentality, an eye for an eye. Um, I remember having a talk with my dad one time. And my dad, he had kind of a unique perspective on some things. If you ever started a fight, he would whoop the tar out of you. But if somebody else started the fight, you darn well better finish it. And he laid down some very clear guidelines for me. Hey, man, if they hit you, you hit them harder. They bring a stick, you bring a brick. <laughs> All right? You be the one that walks away. All right? Mostly that was with my brother. <laughs> <laughs> I hope he didn't give him the same lesson, but I think he did, because a lot of times he's the one that got to walk away. <laughs> but we went at it with a lot of stuff. You know, I mean, we went at it with sticks and knives and all kinds of stuff. Uh, you know, that's the joke in our family. Uh, for Christmas, he and I both got knives. I got a Swiss Army knife, he got a buck knife. <laughs> New Year's, we got them taken away. <laughs> for fighting with them. We did get them back. That was my wedding gift from my mom. <laughs> I'm not kidding. She did. She held it until our wedding. <laughs> she gave me his buck knife and gave me my Swiss Army knife. Uh, and she was a very wise woman. <laughs> The Jews had a saying, an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. I understand that because I, I grew up with that. I understand if you push me, I'm going to hit you. If you hit me, I'm going to take you down. I understand that principle. And when we come to Christ, he says, oh, wait, 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 wait. Don't do that. Okay. Now, keeping in mind a lot of my interaction violently was with my brother, who I love. I wasn't convinced of that at the time, sometimes. Actually, that's not really true. Because I was the only one that was allowed to fight with my brother. I got into several fights because of him. Because people would badmouth him. Okay? So I did love my brother. I just sometimes didn't like him so much. But when we come to Christ, a new model is put into place for us. Remember we talked about the knuckle of the cross. How when we walk up to the cross, everything is canted. And when we look through the cross, God writes it for us. But we live so long with everything canted, it looks off. It doesn't look right to me. It's like we went around our entire life with one of those kaleidoscopes, but except we got two of them. And we're going through life, and we learn to accept this is the way that everything is. My brother-in-law spent his, most of his life up until he was in his 30s uh, with very, very poor vision. And when he was in his 30s, he got his first pair of glasses. He had no clue that from a distance you should be able to see leaves on trees. <laughs> he thought they should look like little kids' drawings where they just kind of draw a big thing around and fill the whole thing in with green because that's the way a tree looked to him. And when he got his glasses, he put his glasses on and he was standing there and he was like, I didn't know you could actually see all the leaves. He was amazed. That's the way it is when we come to Christ. When we're looking through that knuckle of the cross. He starts to turn things aright. Okay? But we can't see it because our, our vision is still skewed. Our brains haven't caught up with what he's showing us yet. And so what he's laying down here is forgive, forgive, forgive. Now, in Colossians, Paul is telling us, he's speaking specifically to our brothers and sisters in the church. Both, both this church and, and universal. When, when you know people from other churches do stupid things that we don't like. Or maybe they, they may not be stupid, but because we don't like them, we assume they are. So, we've got to change our vision a little bit here. Okay, so the first thing is, he's not telling us a qualitative statement as to you're saved or you're not saved. If you don't forgive, you're not saved. Because what sin has he not forgiven? Okay, it's a measure whereby we look to where we are. We go, oh, oh yeah, I still have a long ways to go. Okay, so... If you have forgiven others their trespasses, your Heavenly Father will also forgive you. That's the freedom that you have. 
Because see, if you cannot forgive others, you cannot relish the forgiveness that God has given you. You can't truly dwell in the understanding of the forgiveness that you have if you're unwilling to forgive others. If your life has been marked, okay, and all of us are marked, everybody has a story. Everybody has an injury. Everybody has an offense. Some of you egregiously injured. Some, sometimes even debilitatingly so. The nastiest of ingredients have been laid before you. And unforgiveness is scooping them up and tasting them every day. Okay? If we can learn to forgive, and don't get me wrong, forgiveness is a process. We're going to talk about that process in a minute. Okay? If you can move into forgiveness, you can then really start to fully realize what God has done for you. Because keep in mind, every sin, every offense is an affront to God first. Every sin is an affront to God first. You understand that? When that person did that thing to you, it was an affront to God first. Their sin was laid at his feet before it was ever laid at yours. Okay? When we get that, we hold on to that. We wrap our minds around that. We understand the true measure of what was done at the cross. All sin is forgiven. It's all taken care of. Okay? Now, some people will cash that check in, and they'll accept that forgiveness. Other people will not. And they will receive in themselves the due penalty for not accepting. Okay. So, he's laid before us. Forgive, forgive, forgive. And just in case you forgot, forgive. Um, how important is it to God that we forgive? Mark chapter 11. Disciples are, the situation is that Jesus has cursed the fig tree, and they're walking by, and the disciples say, they, oh, wow, the, the, the fig tree is withered, and look, look, wow, that was quick. And, and Jesus says some things, and, and he's talking about uh, what faith can do, but, but what he says, what tags right on the end of this, okay? Pay attention, because he says, have faith in God. I'm in verse 22. He says, have faith in God. Truly I say to you, whoever says to this mountain, be taken up and thrown into the sea, and does not doubt in his heart, but believe that what he says will come to pass, it will be done for him. Therefore I tell you, whatever you ask in prayer, believe you have received it, and it will be yours. Now watch this, because there's an important word here. <clears throat> okay? In the Greek it's called kai. In English it's called and. Connecting the two thoughts. And whenever you stand praying, forgive if you have anything against anyone, so that your Father, also who is in heaven, may forgive you your trespasses. Now, check this out. Does God want us to pray? Yeah. Oh, absolutely. God wants us to, to be in prayer. Matter of fact, we just talked about the model prayer. That's the, the sample for us. That's the example for us to follow. He wants us to pray. He wants us to communicate with Him. But if you're praying, and there's unforgiveness, stop! Stop! Correct! And then continue praying. Okay? See, you've got a barrier. You've got a tripwire. You've got a snare that is preventing you from full access to the throne. Not because of what God's done, but because of what you're doing. Okay? Um, when we lived in Oklahoma, uh, Christopher was, I would say, about four years old. And Donovan was right up to And we went to the public pool. And um, we were down in the, the head. It was probably about five feet deep. And, and I was trying to get the kids to learn to jump into the water. 
And Christopher had some trust issues with Dad, and, and justifiably so. I, I wasn't always a good catch. <laughs> but uh, Christopher would run right up to the edge of the pool. <laughs> you sure you're going to get me? And then he went. Okay. Donovan, on the other hand, wouldn't even wait till I was ready. Donovan, I'd be like catching Christian and I'd go down. <laughs> <laughs> we're like that with God. Okay. When we're with unforgiveness, we come running right up to the edge and we slam on the brakes and stop. Because we have stuff we've got to deal with. Okay? And another part, now this is kind of funny. Uh, I'm just going to touch on this for a minute because the, offend, the offender isn't off scot-free. Because another part, Jesus says, you know, if you bring your gift to the altar and there realize, you've offended someone, lay your gift down. Don't even present it, just put it down. Go and be reconciled. And then come back and offer your gift. Okay? So there, there's a two-way street here. But we're not talking about them, we're talking about you. Okay? So how important is it to God? Bury it. Stop your prayers. Deal with it. Now, is it a one and done? Absolutely not. Absolutely not. Because we have this stupid human nature in us that likes to replay, likes to remix our drink, likes to, we relish the drinking of our sin, our unforgiveness, and, and so we have to deal with this day in and day out. Now, there's a, a quote that I read one time. And it talks about, you know, oh, forgive and forget. And it talks about one of the essential differences between men and women. Men forget but never forgive. Because if you bring it right back up, they're going to be right back to as angry as they were before. Oh, yeah, I remember that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. We well, haven't said anything for seven years. Yeah, you know why? Because I forgot. <laughs> now you thank you for reminding me. Okay. But, but the converse side of that is women forgive, but they don't ever forget. They, they, they'll remember it, and they'll remember exactly what you were wearing. <laughs> I remember when you were wearing that blue shirt. You were sitting in that gray chair that we used to have, the one that broke about 14 years ago. Remember when you said that thing? Well, I've forgiven you for it. <laughs> Wait a minute. Yeah, that was that day that you, uh, you, you started it. Yeah. Okay, so, but, but see, the, the nature of forgiveness isn't, we can't just forget. Our brains are not designed to just forget. You can't just tell yourself, stop thinking of that. Don't, don't do that. Okay? Because our brains were not exist, designed to exist in a vacuum. Okay? Something's got to be going in there. Now, one of the things that I learned a while back when I was really learning to forget. Um, you know, I, I had a very tense childhood with my father. Uh, my father's chair used to sit right above my bedroom, and he had a lazy boy, and when he would sit up, he could hear it wham, wham! And I would lay in my bed, and I would count the stairs to make sure he wasn't coming down. Okay, he's going to the bathroom. Okay. Because I lived in fear of my father. Um, my father did not have a good relationship with his father. He didn't know how to parent. His idea of parenting was boot camp. The Navy taught him all he knew about being a father. And he treated his kids like boots. Okay? And I lived in fear of my dad. Um, until I came to the Lord. My dad came to the Lord and I, I, then I struggled with unforgiveness. You know, I had 16 years of garbage to work through. And I was uh, in college, and I'd come home, and I needed to go to the base to get some insulin. And usually my mom and I went, and we made a day of it, and we went and saw the doctor, and, well, actually, you went and waited for an hour and a half, and then you saw the doctor for six and a half minutes, and then you went to the pharmacy and waited for another hour and a half for the guy to walk up and say, um, oh, yeah, I need to check this out, and then you waited another hour before he came back, and he handed you the stuff, and you went to go get lunch. So we made a day of it. Well, my mom had to work that day. And my dad was like, I'll take you. <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> well, you have to understand two things. One, when I was a kid, I didn't talk much at all. Okay. Now, my parents actually sent me to a psychologist because I didn't talk. They thought there was something wrong. Huh? 
there's seven people in this house. Five of the seven people don't stop talking. <laughs> they always talk. You think they're going to hear me? They don't care. What's there to say? My dad was my example because my dad never talked. So going places with my dad was painful because you got in the car and you had to drive for 45 minutes to get to the place. Then you had to sit for an hour and a half. Then you had to talk to the doctor. At least you got the six and a half minutes of talking to the doctor. And then you had to sit for another hour and a half and then another hour. And then you went to lunch. You ate in total silence. And this is what I'm looking forward to. So it started off pretty much like I thought. 45 minutes of silence. Went in, waited for the doctor, got the insulin. Now on the way out, my dad asked me, he said, would it be all right if we went over and saw Grandpa's grave? Well, sure. Okay. So we went over and we went to my Grandpa's grave. And my dad did something he'd never done to me up, up to that point. My dad started talking. <coughs> And he started sharing with me his life as a young, as a boy and as a young man. And he started sharing, you know, I didn't know. I knew my dad's parents were divorced, but, uh, you know, I didn't know how it came out. I didn't know, you know, he was telling me he went fishing with his dad one day and he fell into the creek. And he was soaking wet, so his dad took him home to change clothes. And he got home to change clothes and nobody was home. Well, that's weird. Where is everybody? So he's knocking on the door. And a lady across the street that was kind of his surrogate mother said, sweetheart, didn't you know your mom was getting married today? He didn't even know she was dating anyone. Mm. Uh, my dad spent time in a boy's home because when his mom and dad divorced, she couldn't take care of him. So he spent time in a boy's home. He didn't understand what a normal <coughs> family looked like. He went in the Navy when he was 17. That's where he understood what interpersonal relationship looked like. Mm -hmm. He was absolutely panicked when having to deal with children. And God started doing something to me that day. He started giving me insight into the hurt that my dad had and the reasons why my dad acted the way he did. Mm -hmm. Now, once I started getting a picture of this, now you, you need to understand something. When I was uh, young, in, in early teenage years, I would, I would dream of killing my dad. I would dream of... of just pummeling him and choking him to death. Mm -hmm. and, and that was not really a scary dream to me. Mm -hmm. And things started to change. <coughs> and Christy and I were married at the time, and she started noticing a change. And there was a lot of reservation in my family when my dad came to the Lord, because when we come to the Lord, we're not just all of a sudden prettied up. Sometimes we still got stuff we got to brush off and we got to clean up. Mm -hmm. And sometimes he had to brush off and clean up a little bit. But he started making, God started making a change in me that came from that moment when Dad asked me, can we go see Grandpa's grave? I want to share something with you. Flip over with me, if you would, to Philippians chapter 4. <clears throat> this is what I found. This is what I believe is one step into dealing with forgiveness. Okay? You can't keep mixing the drink. You can't keep partaking the drink. You cannot keep dwelling on the offense. You cannot keep dwelling on the offense. Paul writes, verse 4, Rejoice in the Lord always. Again I will say, rejoice. How often are we supposed to rejoice? Always. What is our life? Supposed to be marked by. When people look at us, what should they see that we're doing? Rejoicing. Okay? So our life should be marked by rejoicing. Why? Has God given us anything to rejoice about? Yes. Absolutely. Absolutely. If you don't have anything to rejoice about, if you cannot think of anything to rejoice about, go read Psalms. Go read Psalms. Start at one and just keep going until you find something. <laughs> Let your reasonableness be known to everyone. The Lord is at hand. There's another reason to rejoice. Mm -hmm. Oh, he's close. Mm -hmm. Do not be anxious about anything. 
But in everything, by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. You know, unforgiveness, I, I found, often with unforgiveness, just kind of tied in there with that is anxiety. You know, when you're dwelling with unforgiveness, you're tense. You just keep it on, you know? That's what sort of shocked me when this whole softball thing came up. And I thought, man, I thought that was done. And all of a sudden, I'm tense. And I'm angry. Don't be anxious about anything. But in everything, by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving. Oh, we got a really good topic coming up. Just in time, we're going to talk about thanksgiving. Not turkey and yams. <laughs> we're going to talk about what it means to be thankful. With thanksgiving, let your request be made known to God. It doesn't end there. Remember that word I told you about? Yeah, and. And the result of this is the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Okay, so we have a part to do. God has a part that he says he will do. We come to him. We lay it before him. God, I am so angry at this person. Have you seen the offense? Yeah, he saw it because he was offended first. God, I thank you for everything that you have done for me. I thank you for the forgiveness I received for my own sins, for my own offenses. We laid them down. And as you are being honest before God and you are laying things down, you'll find this peace just kind of stealing over you. Just kind of stealing over you. But see, it doesn't end there either. Because let's read a little bit further. Finally, brethren, remember I talked about the vacuum in your brain? Whatever is true, whatever is honorable, whatever is just, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is commendable, if there is any excellence, if there is anything worthy of praise, think about these things. See, one of the things we don't like is we don't like, we don't appreciate that God expects us to control our thoughts. We want them to just kind of run where they will, will we know? <clears throat> Look at what he tells us to think about. This is one of my life verses. <clears throat> I tend to be, you know, uh, I said perfectionist. I tend to be selfish. I like things to go a certain way. And when they don't, they frustrate me. I spent a lot of years frustrated. Uh, you know, we would look outside and critique you and say, what a beautiful day. Aren't the mountains beautiful? And I'd look outside and I'd go, dang it, it's hazy. Hmm. And I could understand what she was saying, but I couldn't really appreciate it. Because all I could see were the flaws. You know, I would, I would make something or I would do something. And Christian would go, wow, that's absolutely beautiful. I'd go, well, that's messed up. I, I should probably change that. And that didn't work very good. So I quit doing things. I used to sing. Uh, I, I toured all over the south, southern United States with a singing group in college. And I don't sing anymore. I don't sing in public anymore. Pray for me. Because I think I'm supposed to sing at my dad's memorial service. And I don't want to. I, I just, I don't see the need anymore. I've got, man, my, my family is gifted musically. Um, even those that don't sing publicly are gifted. And I, I don't see the need for it anymore. But what is supposed to go in here? See, I can dwell on the offense. I can dwell on the negativity. I can dwell on those things that come easy to my mind. But he tells me, don't. Because those things, let's bring this around full circle, those things lead to anxiety. Nobody is happy in my house when I think like that. Because I become unhappy. And when I'm unhappy, Christy's unhappy. And when mom's unhappy, nobody's happy. <laughs> okay, Glenn, what is true? What is honor? What, what, what is honor? Can you think of anything that is honorable? 
What is just? What is pure? Annalise's laughter is pure. A baby's belly laugh is pure. Whatever is lovely, my wife is lovely. My wife is lovely. Whatever is commendable, gosh, all I gotta do is look at you guys and all the things that you guys do to help each other. And there's lots commendable. If there is any excellence, if there is anything worthy of praise, think about these things. I'll tell you what. God has given us so much to think about. Why would we waste our time thinking of anything else? Mm -hmm. So, Paul's laying out. Now he's, he's given us what the fruit looks like. Now he's telling us how it works. Okay. Now keeping in mind, this isn't just Paul's idea of how a successful church operates. This is God being inspired of God's Spirit to say the things that God wants you and me to know. Bear with one another. Don't be so easy to offend. How many times, you know, I get offended and they didn't even—they weren't even talking about me. And I'm all in a huff and then I realize, you know, Christy will say something to, to Mackenzie and I get offended because I think they're bad-mouthing me and they weren't even talking about me. They were talking about some stupid thing on the internet or something. We're so easily offended. We're so eager to take offense. Don't. Bear with one another, step one. And if you have a complaint, refer back to step one. You forgive, because we dwell in the now. Quit mixing that toxic potion of gall, a bitter gall. Quit sucking it down every day. Dwell in the forgiveness that God has given you, and by extension, you grant to others. Amen? Amen.